Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Science Writers Workshop on the Roman Space Telescope, hosted by the Space Telescope Science Institute. I'm Christine Pulliam, and I'll be your host. This workshop features a panel of speakers on a variety of topics. The format of the workshop is that we'll go through all of the speakers in order and then open it up to questions and answers. You can ask questions by typing them into the YouTube chat window. Uh, please note that you can type your questions at any time during this workshop and we'll work our way through them during the Q&A. And now let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Olivia Lupi from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center will tell us about Nancy Grace Roman and her legacy. Dr. Julie McEnery from the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center will introduce the Roman Space Telescope and its wide field instrument. Dr. Jason Rhodes from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory will introduce the coronagraph instrument. Nobel laureate Dr. Adam Rees of the Space Telescope Science Institute and Johns Hopkins University will tell us about the dark universe. Dr. Rachel, Rachel Somerville of the Flatiron Institute and Rutgers University will tell us about galaxies across cosmic time. And Dr. Harry Ferguson from the Space Telescope Science Institute will tell us about science synergies of the 2020s. And now I'll hand it off to Dr. Lupi. Thank you, Christine. Uh, this is Olivia Lupi, and I'm going to start my video. Okay. Okay, I'm assuming my first slide is on the page. You're good to go. Very good, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm honored to be talking about Nancy Grace Roman at this workshop, and I'm also uh, honored to be on this panel with, with my very, very distinguished colleagues. I'd like to read this to you very quickly. Um, we name great things after someone to honor profound discovery, a singular contribution to a discipline. We name great creations after people who were trailblazers, the first to achieve a pivotal goal when conditions were not favorable to do so. When challenges were astronomical, they drove themselves tirelessly to turn nothing into something. And in doing so, they continue to inspire us. They give to us a vision and they power our hope. And when an esteemed person achieves these great things, but you know, with a gentle uh, voice, with modesty and fairness, and when integrity and passion drive every action, the honor we bestow is deep-seated and heartfelt. Dr. Nancy Grace Roman, 1925 to 2018, and the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope. So who is Nancy Grace Roman? Well, she was born curious. She was a scientist, a doctor of astronomy, she was the first female professor at the University of Chicago. She was NASA's first chief of astronomy and first woman to hold an, first woman to hold an executive position. She won numerous awards, which we'll, which we'll take a look at in a little while. She spent her lifetime as a champion of education, STEM, and women in the sciences. She was the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope and now uh, she has the next NASA's great observatory, WFIRST, named after her. So she was born curious. Um, at a very early age, her mother took her on nature walks, stargazing, uh, at, starting at age five. Her father m came up with these uh, games that she could play, and she had a lot of fun doing it where she would where he would ask her questions and she would do mental arithmetic in her head this was at age eight she started an astronomy club uh, at age 10 and they looked at this book seeing stars uh, to learn all the constellations and of course she decided to be an astronomer at age 12 many many of us uh, astronomers decided very early on to do so okay so there were other dimensions to her childhood Due to her father's job, the family moved frequently, five states by three years old, eight schools prior to high school. And every time she had to go to a, a new school, she had to study extra to learn the curriculum because the curricula were different. And I was talking to her a few years ago about this, 
And I asked her, you know, you were the new kid in class all the time. You were permanently the new kid, the new kid in school. And, you know, did this frustrate you? Did, did all the extra work uh, make you sad? She said, no, I just got on with it. She did say this, what bothered me the most is that I found it difficult to make close friends. Although I probably would have been an introverted bookworm, the impermanence did not help. Also, from a very early age, she was discouraged uh, uh, to go into a career in science because she was a woman. Her parents were supportive but concerned. Anyway, all these experiences that she had as a child made her flexible, determined, stubborn, and open to new things, all of which you will see that she needed throughout her life and career. Nancy Grace Roman went to Swarthmore College, got a BA in astronomy. She credited Swarthmore for uh, her interesting life. She blossomed there. She blossomed in terms of her social life, her openness to new interests and new things, and to social issues. Then after college, she went to the University of uh, Chicago and got her PhD. At that time, she, she wrote many excellent astronomy papers, fundamental papers, but she wrote a landmark paper in 1950, which actually was on the list of 100 most important astronomy papers in the 100 years of the Astrophysical Journal, which is the Astrophysical Journal was the main, is the main astronomical journal, professional journal for astronomers. After her PhD, she remained at Yerkes. She was an instructor, researcher, and then an, an assistant professor. During these times, she continued to grow. She said that her foundation, her science education was excellent at Yerkes when she was in grad school. But it, quote, it was clear that they, the astronomy department, did not want to educate women. So she had hurdles to overcome, always hurdles. Um, she was ignored by her thesis advisor while she was writing her thesis. She was ignored for six months. And I was talking to her about this um, again, at the, you know, a few years ago. And, and I said, you know, that, that would have devastated me. I would have been disillusioned and I probably would have quit. I mean, I don't know how I could recover from my thesis advisor, not, not only not helping me, but not talking to me. And she said, no, I didn't know why it happened, but I just got on with it. And she did. She talked to other professors. She got help from visiting astronomers. She, she figured out how to continue her thesis work. And she did. She graduated, uh, she graduated in time with her PhD. Then afterwards, she was working at Yerkes. Uh, she was curious about why she was getting paid less than some of the techs who had bachelor's degrees and far less experience than her. And she went to her, her um, uh, department chair, asked about it, and another professor, uh, Supermenian Chandrasekhar, who was a Nobel Prize winner in 1983 and just a wonderful, a wonderful astronomer. But he said, and she says, he said this innocently, we don't discriminate against women. We can get them for less. Anyway, this made her resilient, self-reliant, creative, dedicated to equality for women scientists. So, um, oops, sorry about that. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, so she, so uh, after after Yerkes Observatory, she went to the Naval Research Lab. During that time, NASA emerged in 1958, and she was asked by a colleague, do you know anyone who may want to set up an astronomy, space astronomy program at NASA? And, um, and she did, and she, she became head of observational astronomy in 1959, primarily UV and optical. And then in 1960, she was the first formal NASA chief of astronomy. And uh, she, she held that role until 1979. She spearheaded and was the driving force behind NASA space astronomy. These are some, as, as you can see down here, I've listed some of the many, many programs that uh, she was responsible for. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. 
Okay, so how did, how did she succeed? How did she get on with it? Well, she availed herself of experts in every astronomy and engineering discipline. She went to them. She traveled all over to talk to the uh, astronomers and ask them, you know, what is it that you want to learn, right? What, what tools can we make for you to learn those things? She became the bridge between engineering, engineers and scientists because they approach problems differently. She sold space astronomy to politicians, astronomers, the government industry, and the public. Here are some of her accomplishments. I don't have enough time to go through this, but these are, these are uh, you know, the first orbiting astronomical observatories. And uh, this top is the orbiting, whoops, boy. Uh, this, this is the orbiting solar observatory which was a series of observatories that looked at the sun in UV X-ray and gamma ray. They also did, you know, detected cosmic gamma rays. The two uh, orbiting astronomical observatories, OAO 2 and 3, were extremely productive science uh, in, in their, each of their ways, ultraviolet and uh, X-ray observations. And then there's the International Ultraviolet Explorer which, whose three-year mission lasted 18 years and had a major impact on astronomy. And there are so many others that you can read about. Then there was the Large Space Telescope. And the Large Space Telescope, uh, was be, start, start, astronomers started to talk about uh, a Large Space Telescope. And it was in 1965 that that Nancy Grace Roman, who again was the chief of astronomy at NASA said, after all, we were never gonna get anywhere if we didn't get started somewhere. And what I have here up here in this little cartoon is that the initial ideas for, for the Hubble Space Telescope, large space telescope in space was to have uh, an astronaut, a, a man, a human, operating the thing and you know Nancy Grace Roman said to herself well we're trying to get away from an atmosphere uh, so we don't want to have an atmosphere anywhere near or in the telescope anyway um, she was a tireless advocate for this large telescope again met with astronomers politicians wrote congressional testimony you know did did all the behind the scenes work she set up uh, a National Academy working group headed by Lyman Spitzer, who is considered the father, oops, who is considered the father of the Hubble Space Telescope. She did everything she could to promote the idea of uh, the Space Telescope and its importance. Um, as you know, uh, the Hubble was launched in 1990 and it's still performing cutting edge science 30, 30 years later. <clears throat> Bridenstine said of her, it is because of Nancy Grace Roman's leadership and vision that NASA became a pioneer in astrophysics and launched Hubble, the world's most powerful and productive space telescope. Hubble Space Telescope's impact on astronomy is not much different than Galileo's telescope. And that wasn't said by Bridenstine, it was said by someone, and I think they're right. All right, let's let's get to awards and honors. Well, there's a whole list of them here and there's even more than what is listed here. Uh, her, her favorite was the, her favorite two, one is the 1962 Federal Women's Award and you can see her here accepting uh, the award with her uh, five other colleagues who received the award also and there with John F. Kennedy. Then her that her other very favorite and most fun award is that she is a Lego. And I can, I don't have to go through each of these pictures. You can see in her face, <laughs> she got such a great kick out of this. She loved it. Um, anyway, you see her here signing uh, the Lego sets. And, and this picture is astonishing. She's with, you know, uh, Margaret Hamilton, uh, both of them signing their Legos at the uh, Legoland Discovery Center. Nancy Grace Roman was an educator. She, she taught throughout her life, even up until the year that she passed away. Uh, she was an educator of all ages. Here she is uh, with some students uh, at, at a Toshiba Explorer Vision, Explorer Vision Award uh, dinner. 
Nancy and I both worked as as uh, expert judges uh, annually for this for this award. She educated uh, children, young adults, and old adults. As you can see here, uh, the old adults here are the Hubble Space Telescope team talking to Nancy in 2014, and she uh, also uh, in 2017 went to the March for Science and the, this is great. She's on the stage. She's waving to her fans. And uh, she had written me an email, um, which I have part of it here, but I won't read it to you. But anyway, she was so thrilled and so excited to have gone to the March for Science and then to have been invited by the Space Telescope Science Institute to attend a three day conference, which was mostly in her honor. And um, she was just very happy uh, after that, those several days of activities. So that's it. Um, Nancy Grace Roman is the mother of the Hubble Space Telescope and now the, the, the uh, new telescope to be launched by NASA. To pay tribute to a singular explorer and inspiration to generations of scientists and engineers, a relentless ally of astrophysics at NASA, a teacher and the mother of the Hubble, Thank you, Nancy Grace, for forging the path. Godspeed. And then she says, she's very well known for saying, I'm glad I ignored the many people who told me that I could not be an astronomer. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. All right, our next speaker will be Dr. Julie McEnery to tell us about the telescope that is named for Nancy Grace Roman and uh, the wide field instrument. Thank you. Um, it gives me um, an enormous amount of pride to be associated with, uh, with a mission that's named after Nancy Grace Roman. Uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is uh, the next NASA astrophysics flagship mission to follow the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it was the top ranked large mission in the 2010 decadal, uh, decadal survey. And the, one of the singular features of the uh, Nancy Grace Roman uh, Space Telescope is that we have a primary mirror that is around the same size as Hubble's. And that means that we have um, a similar sensitivity and a similar angular resolution or uh, a sharpness of uh, vision with which to see the universe. But what makes us unique is that we've got a field of view a factor of 100 larger. So this is illustrated uh, here in this image of the Eagle uh, Nebula. And in the center, you can see uh, the uh, famous Hubble um, Pillars of Creation um, image. But this observatory is, uh, it's not just that it's 100 times uh, the field of view of, uh, of Hubble. We're designed to be, um, uh, to be a survey instrument. So uh, for example, if we look at a, a large survey that Hubble did of uh, the Andromeda galaxy, um, over 400 individual pointings to make up uh, the FAT survey could be completed in, two, in just two pointings with, uh, with Roman. But the increase in speed of this survey is much more than 100 because uh, Roman has more efficient slew and settle. Um, in other words, it takes less time to go from one place to the other and stop and be ready for the next observation. We don't pass through the South Atlantic anomaly. We don't have interruptions in observations because uh, the Earth gets in the field of view. So in this particular case, um, the increase in speed to do this survey isn't a factor of 100. It isn't a factor of 200. It's a factor of over 1,000. So with an observatory like, um, uh, like Roman, um, we can view the universe in an entirely new way. Uh, we can do um, surveys of things where we can wait for things to happen because we're looking over a large enough field of view to find uh, things that, uh, that go off. Or we can survey large regions of the sky to map out uh, distributions. So with this large amount of larger field of view, more efficient observations, we're getting more information, which of course translates into much, much more data. So one of the other features of, 
of uh, the Roman observatory is it's going to change how, we're, how we interact with our data sets, uh, that the amount of data is much, much larger. So the typical astronomer is not going to be downloading data to their, um, uh, to their home machine and doing analysis. And instead, we will have, we're introducing ways where people can work remotely um, on, the, on the data. Another way in which uh, Roman is, uh, is unique is that one of our science drivers is uh, to study uh, cosmology, to study the structure and evolution of the universe. And we do this with several surveys. And as I said, we're designed to do surveys. A large survey um, away from the uh, uh, galactic plane is designed to uh, detect hundreds of millions of galaxies and measure precisely the position and distance to each one. A fraction of these, we can also very precisely measure um, the shape of those galaxies and look for um, deviations in the measured shape of the galaxy uh, produced by dark matter between uh, us and, uh, and those galaxies. We also plan to have a, another survey that points uh, again away from the, um, from the Milky Way galaxy that goes back to the same spot on the sky every five days for years. And this survey will monitor hundreds of thousands of galaxies and find every supernova that occurs in that region. We'll detect tens of thousands of supernovas and we'll use those as a standard candle as yet another way to explore uh, the structure and evolution of the universe. And the next speakers will describe uh, this in more detail, but the point that I want to make here is that measuring galaxy shapes is hard that we need to understand our point spread function um, uh, to one part in a thousand. That's a factor of a few better than Hubble. We need to understand um, our flux measurement, our ability to uh, translate how much light we see in the detector to how much light actually came from the object to a factor of 10 better than Hubble. So what we're doing is not only making observations over a larger field of view, but we're making those observations much, much more uh, precisely so that we can get an understanding of dark energy, dark matter, and understanding of potentially modified gravity. Unlike uh, Hubble, uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is not uh, in orbit around our Earth. So what you're seeing um, here is uh, the moon going around the Earth on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see Roman in its orbit around uh, the second Lagrange point. This orbit is what enables us to have a patch on the sky that we can uh, monitor for supernova for years at a time un uninterrupted. It's also what allows us to, um, uh, to let me move to the next slide, uh, to monitor um, our galactic center um, every 15 minutes for, um, for months at a time because the Earth is not getting in the way. With our observations of the galactic bulge, we're not focusing here on cosmology. One of the things that we can do here is to um, look for changes in brightness of stars caused by uh, the gravitational lensing as a star with a planet moves, uh, moves in front. This technique will allow us to measure um, ice and giant uh, planets similar to the ones in our solar system that are unattainable by other surveys. So we'll complete the census of the mass of exoplanets while simultaneously be sensitive to planets down to the mass of our Jupiter's moon um, Ganymede. So this has been a very quick uh, whirl through of the Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope that we've got a large field of view, that we've got uh, an orbit that promotes uh, um, uh, stability of the observatory so that we can have an extremely uh, precisely and well understood observations um, and that we can have uh, continuous both large surveys and um, highly temporally um, resolved surveys uh, to do unique science. And I've intentionally ended on exoplanets as, uh, uh, as a science case, because the next speaker is going to focus on the second instrument on Roman, uh, which is designed uh, to image exoplanets themselves directly. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to Jason Rhodes uh, to tell us about the coronagraph instrument.
You need to unmute, Jason. Yes, now I'm unmuted. Thank you. How about now? Is the slide okay? Looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Julie uh, just told you about uh, all the exciting science Roman is going to do with its wide field instrument. I'm going to tell you about the second instrument on Roman, which is the coronagraph instrument or CGI. This is a tech demonstration instrument meant to prove out a number of technologies that we think will revolutionize the field of exoplanet study over the coming two decades. Exoplanets, of course, are planets outside of our solar system. And over the past few decades, uh, we've discovered about 4,000 exoplanets. In one of the surveys that Julie just described, Roman itself will discover another 2,000 exoplanets. But of these 6,000 plus exoplanets, most of them have been detected indirectly. That is, we look for a wobble in the starlight or a blinking of the starlight, and we don't see the planet itself. A coronagraph is an instrument, on the other hand, that's designed to take pictures of the planet itself. And in this artist's recreation here, I'm showing you uh, conceptually how a coronagraph works. So we have this planet uh, orbiting a star, and if we wanted to use a regular instrument on a regular telescope to look at this, the star would overshine the planet. So the planet would be lost in the starlight. So what a coronagraph is, it's an instrument that has what we call an internal occulter, simply a disk that goes over the star, blocks the starlight, and allows us to see the planet itself. Now, the reason that this is very, very challenging is because stars are so much brighter than planets. So what I'm gonna show you here is an analogy. So if you imagine a sun-like star and think of that as a lighthouse, a very big, very bright planet like a hot exo-Jupiter that's so hot it's giving off its own light would be about a million times fainter than that sun-like star. This is like trying to see a firefly flying around a lighthouse if you're thousands of miles away from the firefly in the lighthouse. However, NASA's ultimate goal is to look for an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone around a sun-like star. This is a contrast ratio of 10 billion to one, or 10,000 times uh, more challenging than this 1 million contrast ratio, which is what coronagraphs now on the ground and in space can do. This would be like trying to see a single-celled bioluminescent organism near a lighthouse if you were thousands of miles away. Now, Roman will not get us all the way there. Roman, we anticipate, will have a contrast ratio of about a billion to one. But we're going to do that by proving out a number of technologies that we think on a future observatory, perhaps in the 2030s, could get us to this 10 billion to one contrast ratio. So the first thing we're going to do with Roman, obviously, is we're going to fly it in space above the effects of the atmosphere, which tend to scatter light and make it much more difficult to uh, block the starlight and let the planet light through. And the first paper to suggest using a space telescope to directly image exoplanets was written in 1959 by Nancy Grace Roman herself. So it's pretty exciting that this uh, instrument is going on the telescope named after her. As I said before, there's a number of new technologies that we're going to prove out here. What I'm showing here is just an artist's recreation of a few pieces of the optical elements of a coronagraph. Uh, the W first uh, Roman coronagraph. And the yellow here is the path of light uh, through the system. If you look up here, you'll see that the light coming in is imperfect. It doesn't form perfect waves. And those imperfect waves are due to imperfections in the mirror and the telescope. We can never build a perfect mirror or a perfect telescope. And because of those imperfections, it's more challenging to block the light of the star. So what we do is we have two small deformable mirrors. These are small mirrors about the size of a quarter, but each of them has about 2,000 pistons on the mirror that allows us to change the shape of the mirror and correct those imperfections in the wavefront. We're also going to use complex coronagraph masks, not the simple disks that I showed you before. These coronagraph masks are designed to send the light from the star to the outer edges of our field, and then we block it with another optical element, and the planet light comes in at a different angle, and so that planet light reaches 
our uh, focal plane, and that's what we detect. But what you're seeing here in this picture is that not all of the starlight is blocked, and that's what makes coronography challenging. We need to block, uh, with Roman, about a billion photons from the star for every one that we detect from the planet. So we're going to test out and prove out five new technologies uh, with the Roman coronagraph. The first is ultra-precise wavefront sensing and control. It's sensing those wavefront errors that I talked about. Uh, and then we're going to correct those wavefront errors with the first use of these small deformable mirrors in space. Then we'll use high contrast coronagraph masks that have a complex structure that's meant to allow us to account for diffraction and reflections inside the telescope and the instrument itself. We'll detect the photons with ultra low noise counting detectors that can detect single photons at a time. And finally, we'll process these images with new algorithms uh, meant for these unprecedented contrast levels. And again, this is going to allow us to get to a, a billion to one contrast ratio, which is a thousand times better than existing uh, coronagraphs. And I think it's, it's a nice coincidence that Julie described that the wide field instrument was a thousand times uh, more capable than the similar instruments on the Hubble. And of course, the CGI, the coronagraph, is a thousand times more capable than existing coronagraphs. But the real goal here is to prove out these technologies that will allow us to fly a future mission that could use these same technologies to look for potential signs of life on Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. All right, now that we've uh, learned a bit more about the telescope itself, we are going to delve more deeply into the science that the Roman Space Telescope will do. So our next speaker will be Dr. Adam Rees, who will tell us about the dark universe. Okay, um, let's see, I need permission to share the screen. Uh, I think Jason will have to unshare first. There we go. Okay, can you uh, see my screen okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining me in this workshop to discuss uh, the capabilities of the Roman telescope. I'm gonna follow up on uh, what Julie discussed in terms of how Roman will help us learn more about the physics of the universe. I'm gonna tell you how over the last couple of decades, we've been observing the expansion history of the universe, how it is pointed to the presence of dark energy in the universe and how uh, hopefully Roman will help us understand some of the enigmas uh, involved in uh, the, what we see about the universe. So uh, when we look out at the universe, we see it expanding around us. This is certainly one of the most remarkable facts about the universe. Uh, distant objects appear to be moving away from us as uh, told by their red shifts and uh, the further away they are, the faster they appear to recede from us. Um, so how do we learn these things about the universe? Well, we have to measure uh, distances to some of these galaxies and uh, their uh, recession uh, as told by their red shifts. And one of the best ways astronomers have of doing that is using a, a class of exploding star called a type 1a supernova. This is a star that has attained the Chandrasekhar mass, uh, and you get a runaway thermonuclear explosion when a star exceeds the Chandrasekhar mass. Uh, these kinds of objects can be seen more than halfway across the universe, and we've been diligently using the Hubble Space Telescope for about 20 years to map the expansion history of the universe. And so once we have measured the distances and the redshifts of these hosts of supernovae, uh, we can make a sort of plot or diagram like you see on the right. And the linear relationship between distance and redshift, the fact that something further away is moving faster from us is the signature of an expanding universe. We measure this relationship or slope to determine exactly how fast the universe is expanding today, uh, a value known as the Hubble constant. And if we look further out, further back in time, we can measure how fast the universe was expanding in the past to compare that to today and see how that rate has changed over time. 
Now, uh, of course, decades ago, we assumed that the expansion of the universe would be slowing because of the attractive gravity of matter in the universe. However, Einstein, who thought about this problem uh, even earlier than most of us, uh, realized there was another possibility, that the gravity of empty space itself uh, could be repulsive and could push back against the attractive gravity of ordinary stuff in the universe. He called this property the cosmological constant, and today we would call this dark energy. Of course, this is not what we expected to be going on. Some 20 years ago, my colleagues and I made some of the first measurements of the expansion history of the universe, comparing the expansion rate today, as you see there in the uh, red data point, to distant points. We thought we would determine whether the expansion was slowing down a lot, that is, we lived in a heavyweight universe, or only a little, that we lived in a lightweight universe. And of course, this was a tremendous surprise when we made these measurements and found that, in fact, the expansion rate of the universe has been speeding up over time. This was uh, really considered a breakthrough in our understanding of the physics of the universe. Um, now, over the last 10 or 15 years, improved data and now a wider range of techniques for mapping the expansion history of the universe, not just supernovae, uh, but we can also use uh, the radiation left over from the Big Bang and certain characteristic spots or spot sizes uh, in the cosmic microwave background, which today uh, delineate the separations of galaxies, uh, are used to measure the expansion history of the universe and show us that we live in an era that is dominated by dark energy today, causing the acceleration. Uh, but was dominated in the past by dark matter, causing it to decelerate even earlier. Uh, understanding why or what exactly this dark energy is that makes up 70% of the universe and what the dark matter is that makes up another 25% is certainly uh, one of, if not the leading question about the universe. Um, and so just to briefly tell you, we have a few ideas about what dark energy might be. Uh, it might be very similar to what Einstein had described, what we would, uh, in a more physics-based way, describe as a static dark energy, that there is inherently <clears throat> energy in empty space. This is a feature, really, of quantum theory. Uh, and in Einstein's general relativity, such energy would cause repulsive gravity. However, uh, there's a terrible quantitative mismatch between these two ideas that makes us really struggle to accept this as a possibility. Uh, another possibility is that this uh, dark energy is due to a field in space and it's therefore a temporary phenomenon. Uh, and so if we could uh, map the expansion history in exquisite detail, we could distinguish between these two possibilities, static dark energy or changing dark energy, or even whether our theory of gravity, general relativity, even applies to dark energy, whether we have actually discovered instead a flaw in the theory of gravity. And so uh, certainly better measurements of the expansion history over the last few billion years are really critical to discriminate between these possibilities. Um, if this wasn't already challenging enough, in the last few years, we've seen another sort of riddle uh, arise, sort of a riddle wrapped in an enigma, uh, as uh, they say, uh, that when we look even with the best uh, observations we have today of the expansion history, and we compare how fast the universe ought to be expanding today based on the observations of the cosmic microwave background, versus direct measurements of this quantity we call the Hubble constant, we are starting to see a tension or disagreement between these. Uh, what it belies, we're not sure. Uh, it raises questions, how well do we know the age of the universe and what are we missing? Is this indeed this, this discrepancy that's showing up? One of the clues we've been looking for about the nature of dark energy or uh, you know, exactly what is going on, it's not clear. Uh, when one looks at the universe from the beginning to the end or from the end to the beginning, the two paths uh, that are disagreeing, we ought to get the same answer. And so this sort of cosmological Rashomon is very much on our minds as we pursue uh, this next stage of adventure. And so as Julie described, Roman has a field of view that is 100 times greater than Hubble, uh, though because of other observing efficiencies, it's more like a factor of a thousand in our speed at which we can gather the kinds of measurements that map the expansion history of the universe. And we really look forward to just probably in the first year of using Roman to surpass all the work we've done over the last 20 years and uh, get a greater handle on the expansion rate. 
Uh, Roman will make use of a number of techniques through the accelerating era and the previous decelerating era, including the supernova distances I described, uh, exquisite measurements of the shapes of galaxies, uh, these spot sizes uh, lit up by the distribution of galaxies, uh, and other measures. Many of these are complementary or can sort of cross-check each other to make sure that we get the kind of precision information we need to separate these different possibilities. So I'll just close with a reminder of why it's so important to us to understand the expansion history of the universe. Uh, and it's really because 95% of it uh, is caused by the gravity of unseen stuff. And this is very profound, very significant. And uh, because explaining it requires us to understand physics uh, theories that really are incompatible, we hope that uh, this clue from nature about how it does physics at the, the interface between incompatible theories will teach us more about the physics of the universe. And so I will end there and uh, go on to the next speaker. Thank you, Adam. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Rachel Somerville, who will be telling us about galaxies across cosmic time. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, I am very excited to tell you about some of the science that Roman will do to constrain galaxy evolution, okay? Let's see if I can get this to work. Are you seeing my slide? Yes, thank you. Wonderful, okay. Um, so we have a baby picture of the universe as it was about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. We call this the cosmic microwave background radiation. And that baby picture reveals that at that early time, the universe was extremely simple. So it could be described by just a few numbers. Now, if we fast forward about 13.7 billion years and look around the present day universe, of course, we see structures of amazing complexity, such as galaxies, walls of galaxies, filaments of galaxies, clusters of galaxies, stars, planets, mountains, trees, etc. So one way of phrasing sort of the big question um, that is a huge challenge for astrophysics is how this complexity arose in the universe and one way that I like to think about it is, can we sort of decode the physical processes that imprinted that complexity onto the universe? So this is a very lightning tour of uh, sort of our modern picture of how galaxy formation works in a cosmological context. So from theoretical and numerical calculations, we know that the dark matter and normal matter in the universe um, had some very small lumps in this early universe that we saw in the cosmic microwave background. And over time, as the universe expanded, gravity was a little bit stronger wherever there was a little bit more matter. And so that caused matter to clump together under the force of gravity and form gravitationally bound structures. So clumps of matter that were not expanding anymore that were held together by gravity. And inside of those cosmic structures, those bound structures, gas could accrete and cool down. And when gas cools down, it falls to the center of the potential well, and it can cool off and begin to form stars. Now, some of that gas may even be able to accrete far, far down into the very center of the galaxy, where it may feed a supermassive black hole. However, once stars start to form and once black holes start to accrete, both of those can produce energetic radiation and that radiation can heat the gas back up and it can even push the gas out of the center of the galaxy or even out of the galaxy altogether. So we sometimes call this um, the cosmic baryon cycle, um, this cycle a bit like an ecosystem where gas is 
falling in, making stars, and then cycling back out and back, back in again. So um, I'm going to present you with sort of three classes of big questions that I think Roman will be able to help us answer. And the first question has to do with a process called reionization. Now, this is one of the strange terminology quirks in astrophysics. Um, so in the very early universe, the hydrogen was predominantly um, ionized. So all of the protons and electrons were, were separated. But then as the universe cooled down, uh, the protons and the electrons combined to form neutral atoms of, of hydrogen. And then there was a long period that we call the Dark Ages, up until about uh, one or 200 mil million years after the Big Bang, when the first stars formed. And those first stars produced photons that then could, again, um, ionize the hydrogen. And so uh, you could sort of visualize these bubbles of ionized hydrogen that would expand outwards and eventually overlap. And since about um, redshift six or so, about a billion years after the Big Bang, we know that most of the hydrogen in, in the universe is ionized. So the question is, what sources produced these photons that caused this process to occur? And how were those sources distributed in space? We think we may be able to measure the topology of these bubbles using radio telescopes. And so it would be very exciting to be able to map the visible galaxies, as we will be able to do with the Roman Space Telescope, and understand how uh, they map onto to these bubbles. So another question, I mentioned that um, black holes may be able to form in the centers of galaxies, is how did the very first black holes form in the very early universe? And how does the environment around those black holes affect how rapidly they can grow? And then remember I mentioned that black holes can cause what we call a feedback process, where as soon as they start to grow, they essentially can uh, suppress further growth of the black hole itself, as well as growth of the galaxy around it. So what you see in the bottom uh, image here is a computer simulation of the formation of structure, galaxies, and black holes um, by my collaborator, Melanie Abouzi. And each X marks the location of a black hole. So you can see in the left panel here that this black hole is in the middle of a very dense structure with many, many galaxies around it. While on the right panel, the black hole has formed in almost a void. There are very few other galaxies around it. Now, these massive black holes in the early universe are quite rare. And so you need to be able to survey over very large areas in order to study these relatively rare objects. And this is something that the Roman telescope um, will be able to do and tell us about how black holes formed and how they affected their surroundings. So if we look at images of galaxies um, in the nearby universe, we see that they have different shapes. So many of you are probably familiar with um, spiral galaxies like our own Milky Way galaxy, or you may have seen images of elliptical galaxies, which are these sort of football roundish galaxies. Um, and of course, there's enormous variety within um, these, these categories. But there are some interesting correlations between the galaxy's shape or morphology and the stars inside the galaxy. So these spiral galaxies tend to have stars with blue colors that are quite young, while the elliptical galaxies tend to have stars that have red colors and are quite old. So there's a connection between the galaxy's structure or morphology and the stars that live inside of that galaxy. And the physics that drives that connection is still um, not completely worked out. But then beyond that, there's a connection between the type of galaxy and its, its contents and its large scale environment. 
So um, on the bottom right here is a diagram of the locations of galaxies in space from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can see again that the, ga the galaxies trace out these very large structures. So the, the structures here have scales of billions of light years. Um, and you, the colors here represent the colors of the stars in the galaxies that are tracing out these structures. And so again, you can see that the red galaxies tend to live in these very dense regions of the universe, sort of the urban areas of the universe, while the blue galaxies are sort of more uniformly spread out um, living in the suburbs. So the third big question is how the physical processes that have shaped galaxy formation over the last 13.8 billion years have interacted across this vast range of scales from individual stars and black holes, which have sizes of less than a light year, all the way out to these scales of hundreds of thousands to billions of light years. And so one reason that the Roman Space Telescope will be so transformational is because of this combination that we already heard about of the high fidelity, the high resolution, the sharpness of the image, and what you can see here will be similar to what we um, were able to obtain with the Hubble Space Telescope here in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So you can see what type of galaxy it is, what is the galaxy's structure, while simultaneously being able to map large numbers of galaxies over these vast areas and so study this connection across um, this huge range of spatial scales. So I will leave you with a summary of my questions um, and end there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> okay, so um, now we are going to have our uh, final presentation of the workshop, which will be followed by Q&A. Uh, and that presentation is by Dr. Harry Ferguson, who will be telling us about science synergies of the 2020s. All right, can you see my screen and can you hear me? Yes and yes, thank you. All right, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow all the other speakers here. Um, so I'm gonna try to step back a little bit from um, the detailed science and um, just try to put Roman in context with other facilities that are coming online uh, pretty soon. Of course, Hubble's been online for quite a while and Roman is a, a worthy successor to Hubble in many ways. Um, the James Webb Telescope, uh, which will be launched uh, in a few years, uh, let's hope that COVID doesn't delay it any longer. Uh, so maybe next year, maybe the year after. Um, and uh, it, it is also a successor to Hubble in many ways. Um, and uh, so I'll describe that a little bit. Um, and um, then there are a, a bunch of other facilities and I will uh, focus on a few of them. I, I added one, so th th across the top of this diagram uh, shows the electromagnetic spectrum running from the gamma rays to the radio and the facilities are placed at sort of roughly the, the place where they are um, observing. Um, and uh, so you can see things uh, stretching from the gamma rays down to the radio. Um, I added LIGO, which does not observe at electromagnetic frequencies. That's down in the lower left, uh, but is extremely exciting observing gravitational waves for the first time. And of course, following them up at electromagnetic in the electromagnetic spectrum is a, is a big science goal uh, for many of these facilities. Um, I'm going to focus mostly on Roman, Webb, um, the Rubin Observatory, um, and, and um, the Euclid Observatory a little bit. Um, coming online as well on the ground sometime in the decade are extremely large telescopes, which I won't talk very much about, uh, but those uh, have the light gathering power that will exceed any of the other ones, uh, but of course are down on the Earth, so have the atmosphere in the way. Um, so the uh, astrophysics communities around the world uh, do strategic planning sort of on a decadal time scale. Um, it's called decadal surveys in the US and there was one done in around 2000, another one done in 2010. Um, 
the highest priority space mission from 2000 was James Webb Telescope. Uh, in the 2010 decadal survey, the highest priority ground-based facility was the uh, what was called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope at the time, was renamed the Vera Rubin Observatory. And then um, a mission that was, um, the, the word W first um, was coined by this uh, committee, um, uh, it, Wide Field uh, Infrared Space Telescope uh, was recently renamed an anti-Grace Roman Space Telescope. Uh, European uh, astronomy does a similar uh, strategic planning and out of not only those, that planning, but competitions emerged uh, Euclid mission, which is very complementary to uh, the other uh, two wide field telescopes I just talked about, and the extremely uh, large telescope, um, ground-based telescope. Um, uh, so I want to talk a little bit about science themes, because that's what those decadal surveys look at to try to decide what facilities they have. And so we heard from um, Adam Reese, among others, about the physics of the universe and dark energy in particular, and the various ways we have of trying to get at and do measurements that are relative to understanding dark energy. So type on a, on a supernovae, uh, finding them and measuring their light curves at, uh, at various distances, gravitational lensing, baryon acoustic oscillations, so measuring the, the positions of galaxies, um, and looking for the signal of clustering in that um, in those positions and velocities, um, measuring the growth of clusters of galaxies are, are some of the major ways, and there are others. Um, planetary systems are a big theme. Looking for external planetary systems via various techniques, transits, high contrast imaging, um, gravitational microlensing. So looking for the effect tiny effect, relatively tiny effect of gravitation of planets um, passing in front of stars uh, while they pass in front of other stars. Um, velocities of, uh, of stars that have planets orbiting them, radial velocities, or positions, the wobble, if you can observe, measure very, very precise positions, measure the wobble uh, that is induced in the position of the star or look for the signature of planets in the dust and debris around other stars, or try to understand the formation of planetary systems in our solar system by studying the debris left or left, the small bodies in our solar system uh, that were left there uh, during the formation of our own solar system. Um, and then Rachel Somerville talked about cosmic dawn. And of course, we have various ways of trying to find and study galaxies. So just going out and measuring, uh, taking images through various filters to estimate colors, measure uh, spectral features with a spectrograph, um, look for supernovae that might be signatures of the earliest stars. The, the certain massive stars explode in what's known as pair instability supernovae. They're rare enough that it takes a wide field of view and a long time monitoring to find them, but they may be among the most um, uh, interesting signposts of the first stars uh, in the universe, if we can find them. Uh, intervening absorption lines, so look for a bright quasar or sum up the spectra of bright galaxies and look at the uh, chemical composition and velocities and so on of the intermediate medium, intervening intergalactic medium absorbing some of the light of those distant objects. Um, Intensity mapping of emission lines this is a fairly new field. Um, it's part of what uh, is motivating radio surveys, but it can also be done at optical wavelengths. And it's basically uh, trying to sum together the sky uh, in uh, just in a very narrow emission line and then look at uh, the clustering signal um, to try to map out filaments and so on in um, intensity of emission lines. Uh, and then another way to get at the earliest galaxies is to look at the oldest stars nearby, because those would have been the ones that formed the earliest. Uh, so in the Milky Way or in the close uh, environment of the Milky Way. Uh, finally, the time domain is just an area of discovery because we've really never had facilities that can cover as much of the sky uh, as frequently uh, as we will have. And this will allow us to find black hole events, not only from time domain surveys uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, but also from gravitational waves. 
um, look for motions of stars, measure motions of stars um, accurately um, over long time baselines, microlensing, uh, and explosions, looking for supernovae or other kinds of explosions, maybe ones that we don't know, uh, that we don't expect. Um, study the pulsations of stars. So there's all sorts of things we can do in the time domain um, with these facilities. Um, so I just want to briefly sort of run through why we need all these different facilities. And basically, you can't build a telescope that does everything. So you have to build multiple facilities. One of the most uh, important ones is the field of view. And we've talked about that a bit so far. Um, I want to uh, mention uh, Roman in context uh, with some other facilities. So the, the big um, uh, blue squares are the Vera Rubin Observatory. The, this big ground-based facility, <clears throat> which has a field of view much larger than any of the others. Um, in fact, uh, it will be the largest uh, camera uh, ever built. Um, and um, put in context are the, the widest area survey that Hubble has done, the Cosmos survey, and uh, a very wide deep one that I was involved in, Candle survey, which took about three months of uh, Hubble observing time spread over three years, so very major project. Um, and um, the LSST, while it has this giant field of view, has a relatively coarse uh, uh, pixel scale and resolution, so pixel scale of 0.2 arc seconds per pixel and a typical seeing of 0.6. Um, the Roman field of view fits inside that, so we can't cover with Roman nearly the area uh, that LSST can cover in one grasp, uh, one, one, one shot, but um, of course we get a finer image. Uh, in contrast to that, the JWST near cam uh, is those two tiny, uh, that's the whole field of view of near cam on JWST. Um, and that's actually bigger than the field of view of Hubble. So it took a tile of many, many of these uh, to make uh, the candles image. And it would take tiles of many, many of these to do similar surveys with uh, Webb. Um, Vera Rubin uh, Observatory, this big ground-based telescope, will have 3.2 billion pixels. We'll image the sky every 30 seconds for 10 years, and we'll have a catalog of about 20 billion galaxies. Um, spatial resolution is another axis, and that's where you really want to get into space or and or have a very big mirror. Uh, and if you do that on the ground, you have to invest in adaptive optics and try to take out the atmosphere, which is very, very challenging and, and won't be done with a wide field of view anytime in our lifetime, I don't think. Um, so uh, this is just a comparison of what a typical image with Roman might look like compared to Rubin. So you'll get much finer uh, detail um, of galaxies and stars and so on uh, with the Roman Observatory. Um, this is a comparison of Webb versus Hubble, which you could take to be uh, Webb versus Roman because Roman's very similar to Hubble in resolution. Um, and so you can see JWST uh, or Webb um, in the visible will have a little bit be better resolution. Um, but as you move further to the infrared, where it, its um, bigger mirror sort of gives it a big advantage and you'll get better resolution. It has a 0.03 arc second per pixel scale uh, compared to Hubble, which was 0.05, and uh, Roman, which was 0.1 in the infrared. Um, and then um, the wavelength range, the spectral resolution, and the sensitivity are also extremely important attributes of telescopes. And I'll try to summarize those on one graph that compares these different facilities. So the Euclid satellite, which is a 1.3 meter telescope being launched in 2022 by the European Space Agency, uh, also to look, uh, it, its big focus is to do kinds, the kinds of measurements on dark energy uh, that we're all hoping all these facilities do. So in particular, measure weak lensing and clustering of galaxies. Um, and um, it uh, is uh, looking in particular or uh, one of its goals is to find emission line galaxies uh, with a, a spectrograph. The spectrograph, while not as sensitive as these imaging limits, so its imaging limit is about 24th magnitude, which is um, it's uh, not 
you need a big telescope on the ground to do that, but it's not particularly challenging to do that from the ground, but you can't do that in the infrared uh, very easily over wide areas from the ground. Uh, it then has a spectrograph that will be able to see these emission lines um, with a, a limiting magnitude that's somewhat brighter, but it, the emission lines still peak over that. It will survey a large fraction of the sky, sort of a, a third of the sky, sky or so. Uh, the Rubin telescope will survey about half the sky, uh, southern hemisphere, uh, so it's a telescope in Chile, and will go much, much fainter. It's an imaging facility only, so it goes uh, very faint in imaging, and it's an optical facility only sort of touching the near infrared. Um, Roman is primarily a near infrared facility. It overlaps a little bit with the Rubin uh, wavelengths. Uh, it can go deeper and it has a, a finer resolution that we just saw. It won't cover nearly the area, about a tenth of the area over the mission. And then the Webb will cover a tiny fraction of the area of any of these surveys, but will go many magnitudes deeper. Um, and uh, so that, that is really what you need. You'll be able to find, for example, Redshift 7 galaxies, which is looking back uh, more uh, within a billion years at the Big Bang. Uh, so very early galaxies. You'll be able to find the brighter ones with Roman, and you can see the sort of signature of their spectrum uh, in the colors of the Roman filters. Uh, but you'll really be able to study them and measure their shapes and measure the fainter ones. Uh, with the Webb telescope and find the more distant ones. Uh, so just to sort of summarize the science trades, and I haven't gone through all of them, so you have the field of view, the spectral resolution, the wavelength range, um, sensitivity. I didn't talk about contrast. Um, Jason talked about that a bit in his talk on the, um, the uh, coronagraph. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the time domain agility. And it, so if you just go back to those decadal themes, uh, you sort of need to emphasize field of view, spatial, spatial resolution, wavelength range, and sensitivity uh, to be studying uh, the dark energy and the physics of the universe. The cosmic dawn emphasizes the spatial, spatial resolution, the wavelength range, and sensitivity. Planetary systems really need everything uh, because the planets are faint, uh, but the stars around them are bright, um, and you need um, to, to look at it over time, and you need a wide field of view for some of the planet finding uh, techniques like micro, micro lensing. Um, and then time domain uh, needs uh, field of view, wavelength range, sensitivity, and some ability, which uh, means the ability to visit fields many times, uh, observe uh, fairly rapidly. Uh, it also, uh, for some uh, science, means the ability to react rapidly, uh, which is a real challenge uh, in, in many facilities to do that. So one example in the time domain, um, which is particularly exciting right now, is LIGO is discovering gravitational wave events. Now you actually might be able to discover those with a wide field survey like LSST uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum before or at the same time as a gravitational wave observatory finds them. But you need a very wide field to have a hope to do that. Um, but um, in the current scenarios, LIGO detects it. You then try to localize it and LIGO's and Virgo together, Virgo is an Italian uh, gravitational wave detector, uh, can localize it to a, an area that's actually still much larger than the LSST field of view. So you need some other facilities to localize to small enough that LSST can find something that may look a little bit different. And in any field, there may be many hundreds of those. So you need to figure out which one it was. Um, and then uh, if you can do that, Webb and Roman can localize it even further within the galaxy and measure it over uh, months and um, weeks and months. Uh, so just to, to bring back to the beginning, uh, there are exciting times to come. W within a few years, we're going to have these revolutionary facilities uh, operating uh, all at the same time. And um, astronomy is uh, just going to continue the revolution that was uh, begun uh, by all the previous telescopes. Uh, so thanks very much. Thank you, Harry. We're all very excited to see what the uh, future is going to bring. All right, so um, for those of you uh, watching this live event, um, I encourage you to put your questions 
chat window and YouTube. Uh, we have some that are already that have already come in, so um, Grant is going to work us through those. Uh, I encourage all of our speakers to turn on their videos um, so that people can see you as you're responding to the questions. So, Grant, do you want to um, kick us off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. I apologize again for our slightly later start than we expected. But uh, the first one is for Dr. Lupier. Uh, what was the subject of NGR's 1950 Top 100 APJ paper? Yes, uh, Nancy Grace Roman uh, was measuring uh, uh, stars, so stars similar to the sun. And uh, she was using spectral classification that, that her thesis advisor and others had defined. And, and what she found was that th these stars that had um, components heavier than hydrogen, we call them metal lines, metal line stars, anything heavier than, than hydrogen. Uh, stars with, the, with metal lines had, uh, uh, had uh, velocities that spanned a large range and uh, these metal line stars had velocity range where they were some of the velocities were faster than you know 70 uh, 70 um, kilometers uh, per second and um, the non-metal line stars also had a range of velocity but not any not the very fast speeds so these stars were not moving at very fast speeds so that was able that then she was able to tell uh, something about, um, you know, the difference between the two sets of stars and uh, learn something about, uh, you know, the first pieces of information about galactic structure, uh, because she found, found these uh, metal line stars, um, weak metal line stars to be older and redder and um, moving in more elliptical orbits, whereas the you know, the stars with, with more metal lines were younger and they were more, they tended more to be in the galactic plane. Awesome, thank you. And so the next step is a question for Dr. McEnery. You mentioned that Roman's observations will be more efficient than Hubble's, but how much more sensitive, if at all, are Roman's imaging detectors versus Hubble's? actually something we talked about in our setup for this. <laughs> um, so the, um, our actual uh, detectors themselves um, are a little bit more, um, uh, more sensitive than, uh, than Hubble's um, and they extend, um, the sensitivity extends out to slightly redder, uh, redder wavelengths, um, but it's not, um, it's not a substantial um, effect. Okay. If there are any further points that you want to make or that you would like us to answer, please put them in the chat. I'm going to go question by question. Um, all right. So next up from AAS Press Office, uh, what is the reference target guide star for the Coronagraphs AO system? Uh, so the Coronagraph, uh, we have not identified a set of target lists yet uh, we're working on that. Uh, in part, it's because the set of target lists will depend on exactly when we launch and uh, exactly when the coronagraph um, uh, will be undergoing its, its technology demonstration. So what we're doing is we're identifying all the possible targets that we could uh, hit, and there's a, a few dozen. And for each of those, there will be uh, uh, a nearby star that we use uh, to uh, what we call dig the dark hole, that is make the dark hole around the star and then we go to the actual coronagraph uh, target uh, which has the planet and we use that uh, dark hole that we've dug uh, to look at the planet. Thank you. All right, so uh, question for Dr. Reese. How, do, uh, how does the, Ro uh, the Roman Dark Energy Survey compare with or expand upon current dark energy surveys, such as DES, HEDDEX, et cetera? Right. Um, well, it will have more area than those for the kind of weak lensing measurements. Um, 
It will go to higher redshifts than the various supernova projects. Um, it will get a greater density of galaxies than the baryon acoustic oscillation surveys. Um, and so we typically uh, quantify uh, how good the dark energy constraints will be as a what we call a figure of merit, which is uh, really the inverse of the uncertainty. And in that measure, um, uh, Roman should be a factor of 10 better than anything we previously knew, which um, you know, one way of thinking about that is uh, if uh, it's just fortuitous that right now dark energy looks kind of like a cosmological constant, then we should have a 90% chance of finding an answer uh, that uh, allows us to separate uh, reality from that value. If, uh, in fact, the right answer is a cosmological constant, then every time we go back and measure a factor of 10 better, <laughs> we'll keep getting the same answer, and at some point, um, we'll get tired. Wonderful answer. <laughs> All right, so uh, it seems like the great advantage of NGR is in its power to deliver statistics, larger numbers of events, greater areas, deep deaths in shorter times, larger time scales. What is the fundamental discovery potential? Are there regimes of the universe that it will be able to observe for the first time that uh, no other observatory, I'm going to assume that was supposed to be regions, uh, that no other observatory hitherto has been able to probe? I'll kind of float that one up and whoever would like to take that can take that. I can take a first stab at that. Um, so, because Roman will be able to simply survey much larger areas, that means that we'll get a sample of more diversity, right? More diverse kinds of environments, more diverse kinds of objects. So for example, with Hubble, um, there just weren't enough orbits to you know, necessarily get those diverse samples. And so you know, we may discover things that surprise us because they're very rare and we weren't lucky enough to see them before. And of course, we don't know what those might be. Um, one example that I mentioned is these very massive black holes that we see at early times. So you know, we know that those exist, um, but we don't know very much about, um, for example, the black holes that are accreting just a little bit less rapidly or a little bit fainter. So that, that's an example. Yeah, I could okay. uh, comment Anyone on this as, as well. I find, um, uh, I mean, it's a very difficult question to answer because you're asking us to, uh, we're being asked to sort of uh, hypothesize on, uh, on the unknown. What, what really excites me um, about uh, Roman is that we're going to find things without looking for them in the sense that the kind of observations that we make aren't, I think there's an interesting galaxy here and I'm going to point there and make observations of that galaxy and there might or there might not be something um, interesting there. We're going to, you know, for example, have a two degree region towards the galactic center that we're going to go back to every 15 minutes. And while we know that that set of observations are going to net us um, a large hole of exoplanets, that same set of observations are also going to provide us um, exquisite um, measurements of the uh, of the motions of the stars uh, there. They're going to um, allow us to find other things that are causing this gravitational microlensing. So we're going to measure um, populations of, um, of neutron stars that might be wandering around our galaxy. We've got the potential with those same observations to maybe identify small clumps of, uh, of, uh, of dark matter. Um, to some extent, the phase space that we open with Roman is going to be a function of how we, uh, of how we do the observations. And I think when you have uh, an observatory with this sensitivity and this field of view, there are many different ways that we can make observations that will open new uh, phase space. And one of the things that we're looking forward to doing over the next uh, few years is working with the community to try and identify what are those ways that we can make uh, groundbreaking observations that uh, open us, uh, provide an opportunity for uh, the greatest number of new discoveries. I just wanted to uh, amplify that point as well, that I think we're entering a kind of new paradigm of uh, sort of astronomical instant gratification. You used to see something interesting, you know, a few objects, 
and you'd say, oh, that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure if it's true. Uh, I'll write an observing proposal to get more time to look at more of those objects. And now, whenever you see something interesting, you're going to be able to immediately sort of download these massive data sets where you could basically see everything and follow up on any interesting signal that you see. So, um, you know, to me, it's very exciting as a scientist that we're going to be able to dive right into everything you see, you know, without waiting. Beautiful. Thank you. And just like anything else, we're only as good as our sample size. We'll be getting it without realizing it or intending to in the surrounding areas. All right. So do the tens of thousands of supernovae that the NGR telescope will measure include all types of supernovae or just the relevant types that we can use as a standard cosmological candles? How many SNLA? Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll take a first swing at this. Um, we will certainly uh, observe all types of supernovae. The observatory is really designed and really spec'd to do an outstanding job on the type 1a supernovae, but along the way we will find a core collapse supernovae, uh, stars that fall directly into black holes. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll find some of these parent stability supernovae. Uh, we'll be able to see supernovae at greater redshifts uh, which means earlier back in time. So uh, if we're lucky, we will see some of the very first supernovae, uh, so-called uh, supernovae that occur after population three stars, which is uh, the first sort of mythical, but sort of first generation of stars. And so we will see all types and there should be enough discriminating power on the observatory to let us know that we are indeed seeing uh, a different type, maybe even a type we've never seen before. And I could add a, a little to that, um, that um, the precise number of uh, supernova one that we detect is a, um, a function of how we choose to take the observations. And we have a choice between um, a set of observations that would net a large number of supernova versus um, a smaller number of slightly better characterized uh, ones. Um, so the uh, expected range of what we might expect to see is anywhere from a few thousand to approaching 20,000, de just depending on, on how the observations themselves are, are made. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, all right, so it looks like we have another one from AAS. Uh, question for Dr. Ferguson. When is Roman expected to launch and how much overlap in time will it have with Webb and Euclid? Get so we are hoping for somewhere around 2025. Um, everything's uncertain these days, so uh, stay tuned. Um, the uh, Rubin Observatory is uh, going online hopefully in, uh, well, actually probably 2021 uh, with a smaller camera and then uh, the larger camera in 2022. Um, and as I say, we're waiting for Webb. Uh, it's, it is, uh, I think, I don't know, I don't recall if it's still officially October of 2021, but uh, 2021, 2022, uh, depending on how things clear up. Um, Euclid is also 2022. Okay. And then they, they um, uh, um, the, the lifetime of the missions, of course, a space mission, you typically uh, have a five-year main life. So Webb and, and, uh, and Roman are, are both nominally five years, and hopefully they will outlast that uh, and we'll get much longer observing times. Okay. Uh, I have a follow-up to one of the previous pre uh, questions. Uh, if the reference target that we use also has planets, what do we do? Ah, that's a that's a great question. So uh, I think what we'll do is we'll uh, choose targets that have uh, that we've already observed before and have planets that are uh, small enough that they wouldn't uh, affect that. Uh, so we have. Uh, chronographs uh, on the ground, and we have a chronograph on the Hubble, and there will be a chronograph on the James Webb. And so we're not going to choose uh, um, stars that we haven't uh, observed before uh, to use with our, our chronograph. 
in, in the initial uh, technology demonstration. We may, uh, if we use it beyond that, we may go searching uh, for stars that we don't know if they have planets. But in the initial technology demonstration, we'll make sure of that. Sounds good. Um, I don't see any further questions. So if you don't mind my, uh, do, you mind, do you mind if I jump in with a couple of quick questions? Go for it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so my first question is for uh, Dr. Ferguson. And I was wondering, um, in the section on the key science themes and specifically Cosmic Dawn, um, you mentioned looking at emission and absorption lines. Uh, does Roman have spectroscopic capabilities too, or will it be more identifying targets for these other observatories you were talking about to study? So Roman has a, a spectroscopic uh, wide field instrument uh, that um, doesn't have a um, it doesn't have a slit to block out the sky, but it um, it can cover a lot of area. So that's a very popular technique. Uh, more of more of a survey kind of um, instrument um, and it's specifically aimed at getting uh, the red shifts of galaxies that will be used to map out this structure uh, to measure dark energy via what's called acoust uh, baryon acoustic oscillation. So it's a signature, uh, a strong signature of, of clustering that we can use as a standard ruler. Uh, but will also tell us about uh, sort of the evolution, a, a little bit about the evolution of galaxies through studying the strengths of the, those lines and how they evolve, uh, and may also be helpful for identifying what kind of supernova it is you saw. Um, so I don't know if any other people want to chime in on spectroscopy with Roman. Well, I could say um, a little bit. Um, we have two, um, we, as you mentioned, we are, we are Spectroscopy is slitless, but we have two, um, we have both a grism and a prism. And the distinction between them is a trade off between um, sensitivity to narrow lines versus sensitivity to broad features, um, so that we have uh, one method that is optimized for narrow uh, emission lines and then a second uh, channel that is uh, optimized for finding the more broad features that we see in, um, in supernovae. Thank you. Um, and my last question is for um, Dr. Somerville. Uh, I was wondering when you were talking about the era of reionization, um, one of the key questions that you mentioned was what are the sources of the photons that are causing the ionization? Um, so are we trying to identify what types of stars were involved or are there other sources in addition to stars that we're um, considering? So um, we think at this point that it was probably mostly stars, um, but people sometimes make a distinction between the very first stars. So what uh, Adam mentioned, the POP3 stars, which form out of pure hydrogen and helium and might have been very massive and luminous and emit extra ionizing photons. Um, versus sort of normal stars, stars more like the stars that are around us today, or maybe something in between, right? There may have been a mix of, of different kinds of populations. In addition, however, um, accreting black holes are also very good at producing ionizing photons because they produce this very high energy radiation. Now, we don't think that they were common enough at these early times to significantly contribute to hydrogen reionization, but, you know, it would be interesting to better constrain the contribution also coming from black holes. And, and just a little note to add to that. Um, if you'd asked people five or six years ago, uh, whether it was uh, stars or early galaxies, uh, most people thought there was a, a crisis, that things didn't add up, and that you, you just didn't have enough escaping high energy photons from galaxies. Um, we now think that there are, um, mostly from surveys from Hubble, um, but uh, if, it, if that budget doesn't add up as we measure it more and more precisely, then you need something else, and that something else could be something as exotic as decaying dark matter, which would be, you know, new fundamental physics. Uh, so you're always, you're always tr trying to push to more and more precise measurements to, to test the limits of, you know, do things, are they, things consistent? All right. 
Uh, we have a follow-up in the chat um, for Adam. Where do JWST, ELT, and others stand in relation to Roman when it comes to pinning down dark energy? And are you optimistic about getting to the bottom of this while in my lifetime? My <laughs> lifetime, too. <laughs> well, I don't know who's asking, so I don't know how long their lifetime is. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, the answer is uh, Roman is just much better suited than JWST or an ELT to study dark energy. Um, dark energy is really about measuring a lot of very weak signals uh, that you have to add up statistically to get a handle on uh, dark energy. Whereas, you know, JWST and ELT both will have small fields of view. They will study, you know, intensely exciting individual objects from sort of the edge of time, but uh, they won't give us that same, you know, gulp of the universe that Roman will. Um, and in terms of our lifetimes, um, you know, it, it really depends on what the answer is. This is one of those situations. If uh, we manage to break the current uh, understanding of dark energy, that it's not the cosmological constant, uh, that could happen very soon. It could happen after the launch of Roman or, or one of the other uh, observatories like Rubin, and that would be tremendously exciting. If uh, it continues to look like a cosmological constant, uh, then uh, as I described at some point, um, you know, we will be beaten into submission in uh, seeing that. And, you know, I can't give exactly the time scale for that. Okay. Let's see. Um, can the panel briefly talk about how such a vast archive of data immediately available will provide opportunities for scientists from anywhere to do cutting edge science? I'll take a stab at that. Um, so we had a really interesting talk at the conference this morning by Dara Norman, um, who was pointing out um, what a huge force for inclusion and equity it will be to have these archives of science ready data products. So this will really um, remove many of the barriers to access that are currently there for people who might be at smaller institutions or people who might not have the specialized background to do a specific kind of data processing and really just enable a huge amount of science and hopefully get more people and more diverse kinds of people from all over the world involved in doing science. So I think it's extremely positive. I've got a follow up question, if I may, Rachel. Um, there's a massive amount of data that's going to come from Roman. And uh, what, what is the plan for, uh, for cutting edge software to manage and to search through and to data mine these, these masses of data? Sorry, I'll, that's the question. I, I used to work for the Archive at Space Telescope many years ago, but I no longer do. So I am not the person to answer that question, but maybe I, I, uh, someone I mean, else on our panel can. I'll, I'll take a hack at it. Um, I mean, it, you've identified a big challenge. Um, so we, um, the, the, uh, uh, the, the side of the, the project that, uh, sort of runs the, the mission and the data management, we will be producing standard products that hopefully are ready for science, meaning that they will have a catalog, they will have images that are cleaned of the, the detector signatures and things like that. Um, but the sort of mining of the data, um, where you say, okay, I, I would like to um, uh, qu query every pixel in some new way. Um, that, that's something that really the community has to figure out how to do. Um, and it's not just for, for Roman, but for Rubin, which has a data volume that's, you know, much, much larger, um, that it, we don't yet know of a way to enable people to look at every pixel uh, in, in any, you know, computationally challenging way because there are just too many pixels. It takes too much computation. Um, but we may be able to use machine learning techniques to enable that. Um, and it's something we, you know, we as an astronomy community have to work on 
to just to figure out you know how to attack this volume of data um, so yeah there are lots of ideas floating out there about how you might approach it um, but I, there is not a, a one pat solution <laughs> to that thank you just to add, it's a fabulous problem to have that you have so much high quality data that you don't know how to manage it. It's the best problem to have given what we have going on here. And the Mast Archives, I think, does a phenomenal job with a lot of that. Um, can we I don't see any more questions from the audience. If you have anything, pop it in, but I'll defer to Christine on whether we should or should not, or if we're going to wrap up. <laughs> uh, yep, yeah, there being no further questions, uh, we are going to go ahead and wrap up the workshop. Um, I want to thank our speakers for their presentations. Um, I thought they were very enlightening. Um, thank you to you, Grant, and Thomas, our tech team. And uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Um, I just want to remind you that, um, as I think I mentioned at the start, this workshop is going to be archived here on YouTube. Uh, we'll be re-uploading a fresh video, um, so that will go to the Hubble channel. And you can also find more information about the Roman Space Telescope online at nasa.gov roman. So thank you, and we will close it out.